Good afternoon, friends. My name is Marjan Shirzad, and I am the Vice President of Community Services and Marketing here at the Mercer Museum, the Bucks County Historical Society. And it is with the greatest pleasure that I welcome you today to this historic program. Um, this is a program that has been in the making for a long time. And a couple, of, a couple of you asked, you know, how it felt, and I said, and the truth is, my heart is full of joy, because we've been thinking about it for so long, and we are just delighted to be able to be the hosts, really, of these amazing stories that you're going to hear today. A gentle reminder, please, to silence your cell phones so that we can enjoy today's program to its fullest, and that thank you in advance. Um, should you need to leave the room at any time, use the restrooms. They're just down the hall to your left and right. Uh, there's also a water fountain there. And we will be recording this today for posterity so that anyone who is not able to be here in person can enjoy it um, on our Mercer Museum YouTube channel. So we will send out the link. And we have some photographers here. Wave to Julia. Julia is our official photographer for the day. We have other great photographers, so smile a lot. The panel will be in two parts today. The first part will be talking about the early years. Then we'll do a short video that is fabulous. It's a trailer for Silent Thunder, the movie, which you'll hear more about. And then part two will be about a very special race in Monterey, California from 1975. And it, direct, it is directly related to that beautiful car that you saw downstairs in the lobby, the white race, race car, the Viceroy. So it's the Super V Volkswagen. And again, the gentleman here can tell you everything about it. But please know that it is an integral part of this talk, um, as is the racing exhibit altogether. Um, I wanted to thank friends and sponsors because without them, these types of programs would not be possible. So indulge me for a moment. Our friends at Visit Bucks County, at Univest, the Bucks County Foundation, Penn Color, the Thompson Organization, Brian and Louise McLeod, Tom Thomas. Tom is actually here today, so Tom, raise your hand so we can all wave at you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, thank you. Millam Insurance Agency, and our members, the members of the Bucks County Historical Society. If this is your first time here, I hope you have such a wonderful time that you will think of joining us. It is membership that allows us to do these types of programs. I'm hoping we knock your socks off and you will think of us and want to come back for future events. The major summer exhibit that we have downstairs is called Racing the Need for Speed. It is going on through September 9th. And it's an original exhibit, which means we did not bring it from anywhere. Our very own Corey Amsler in the back spent two and a half years of his life getting all of this together. <laughs> and it's an exhibit that explores all aspects of the history of racing in Bucks County, in the Delaware uh, Valley, across four sports. So we have foot racing, bicycle racing, horse racing, and of course, motorsports. And today's panel is about motorsports and that thrill and need for speed. Why race, you ask? We race to compete. We race to imp improve ourselves. We race to master our machines. And we race to find community with others and to have fun. Anyone here race for any of those reasons? Let me, let's think of it. Have any of you ever raced for any of these reasons? Yeah, I, that's why we race, for the thrill and for the community. Ultimately, it's about the spirit of racing and competition. It's what drives seemingly ordinary humans, I say seemingly, to do extraordinary things. The people that you will hear today are extraordinary in their achievements. They are pioneers, they are visionaries, and they are trailblazers who saw opportunities and they met challenges. As we begin today's historic panel featuring our old friends, I'd like to remind you that these are stories that have never been told to an audience in this way ever. So first and foremost, I would like to give all of our panelists a huge round of applause. I 
I know that you know our wonderful friends at the African American Museum of Bucks County have a table downstairs. I cannot encourage you enough to go down there, learn more about their amazing work, support them. Um, they are our partners in this panel, and we can't thank them enough. So without further ado, yes. And I see Linda here who's just stopped. I just mentioned the museum. Linda, would you like to share a few words or shall we meet you downstairs at the end? Okay, all right. So there's plenty to learn. Linda's fabulous. And um, I think you will just enjoy getting to see their work as pioneers in this day. So are we ready? Are we ready to learn about the spirit of racing? Okay. To my left, we have our panelists for part one. We have Mr. Leonard Miller. We have Mr. Carl Huck Hucksmith. We have Mr. Bill Young. And last, but certainly not least, we have Mr. John Griswold. And I'm going to turn it over to you, gentlemen. And Len, if I can pick on you to start, I'd appreciate it. If you could kindly introduce yourselves and tell us just a little bit about you, please. Good, good afternoon, everyone. It's a, a distinct pleasure uh, being here today. Uh, this is a historical occasion, and I started out racing here in Bucks County at Vargo. Uh, my experience is I'm in three Smithsonian uh, museums. I'm in the top five uh, African-American pioneers in American uh, history, and in the Black Athletes Hall of Fame, and good friend Bernie Chavis had put me in a, a, a organization down with the sports and culture in, in Philadelphia. So it's, it's a, and my wife is here today with me. She's going through this for so many years. But I'll explain, I'll explain more what we're doing when we, when we are talking. My name is Carl Huck Smith and I was a race car jockey. <laughs> How many pounds? About 110. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well this is me, Bill Young. I had fun while I had it, but uh, those days are gone now. But. Mm -hmm. Thanks for all you people to come out. I feel good. Okay. <laughs> okay, my name is, of course, John Griswold. If you got a good antique cast iron frying pan, you'll find it spelled correctly on the back of it. <laughs> <laughs> but my drag racing time goes back into actually 1960, and Leonard likes to give me credit for bringing him into drag racing. <laughs> and so on that note, how did you all get started in racing? Where did the love of the automobile start for each of you? Yeah, for, well, for me, it was that I had a 1959 Plymouth Sport Fury had swivel front seats. That is, the driver's seat actually turned when you yes, opened the sir. door to get in and out of it. And I had heard about a drag strip, but didn't really know too much about it. But I said, well, let me see how fast this car would really go. And I went over to Atco, New Jersey, and I found out you couldn't drag race unless you had seat belts in your car. <laughs> so that was my first trip to a drag strip. So after that, I came back to Philadelphia and I went to a car upholstery place and they put uh, seat belts in my car. And the next week I was back over there 
at Cohen. That was my first drag racing experience. Bill, when did you fall in love with vehicle with automobiles? Well, I was a mechanic. My dad was a mechanic, and after school, I had to go down to the garage, help him work on cars. And I just like cars. Mm -hmm. Then I got uh, my driver's license and pull up to the light. I wanted to beat the car next to me, and <laughs> my car wasn't fast enough, so I go back to the garage and I work on it. And after a while, I decided, hey, I want to go to the racetrack. So I started going to the racetrack. We got treated, I got treated okay in a way, in a way it wasn't, but I was still there. And it was lots of fun, a lot of work, a lot of headaches. And Carla, he stuck with me. And uh, we had a name going for ourselves, especially on the streets. And uh, we finally made it to the track. The boys down south didn't like us because we had a tow piece with NAACP on it. And they just, they just read NAACP. They never read what it meant. But uh, they told us, you boys can't race this thing here. So we had little problems down south. Mm -hmm. But after that, <laughs> oh, so, so just to National fit. Association for the Advancements of Crisis and Clemens. <laughs> <laughs> they, had, they had problems reading the underneath what it meant. Great for the Clemens. Yes. And uh, we got turned away from quite a few tracks, but after a while they invited us back again, and uh, we went down. We had it was always fun whenever we went out. And we had, we had good times, we had bad times, but we had good times, but we financed ourselves, we had a good time after the race was over, whether we won or lost, and that was it. And we're gonna talk more about both the good and the bad, because I think it's really important in the conversation to hear about both. Yeah. Um, and Huck, if I could trouble you to tell us when your love for the automobile started, and then we'll come right back to the good and the bad. Well, when I was about 12 years old, I used to live over 47th and Woodland. I used to hear this noise coming home from school, all this noise. I couldn't figure out what it was. And one day I walked down to 46, and it guided me in the path, um, Save, uh, Save, um, Melville, Melville Street. We used to call it Gasoline Alley. And um, I heard all this noise. I looked and seen this thing out there. They had a long front end and all these flames coming out the pipes. I was hooked from 12 and a half years old. <laughs> that was it. I used to, I didn't, you know, I'm hoping my, you know, my mom's not here, but I used to hook you from school, <laughs> go down there, race, on, work on the cars. And when I turned, when I turned 15, he threw me the pair, I mean, the, um, the fire suit said, so you think you could drive this thing? And it was history from there. That was it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Echo was the only one that stopped me from racing because in Jersey you had to be 18 and I was just maybe about a couple months from turning 16 so we couldn't do no Jersey racing and we used to just run all over down towards the south and north, um, the west side of Pennsylvania, Lebanon Valley and places like that. That's what got me, the noise is what got me. I love it. Tell them, tell, tell them how fast you went. Oh, yeah. Well, eventually. Tell the story. Tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> tell the story how you came through the riots and, yeah. and to get to the yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, we went through. <laughs> we went through things. There's mm -hmm. no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. But I was young. I was so young. I I was just into the car, mm -hmm. the, the car and the noise and you know just working on it. So. I really didn't pay that no mind or a little prejudice -y thing, you know what I mean? Because um, I was just into the car, you know? But um, I seen it, but you know, when they used to, especially the only thing that got my attention is when they used to turn us away from the, turn us away from the track. And the best I went, I think it was like 192, wow. and mm -hmm. that was a 66. <laughs> at, at like, in a quarter of a mile. In a quarter of a mile, yep, in a quarter of a mile, 192, like eight, I think I was going like maybe eight seventies, eight eighties, and uh, that was good. The record was over here. And that was good back then. And <laughs> yes, everything sir. we needed, Bill made it at Western House. So he worked at Western House. We we couldn't buy all them fancy 
bullet brackets and all that stuff. He would make them down, you know, when he was working at Western House overnight or whatever, the weekends. And we used to work on the cars, going from one track to the next on the outside, oh, no, going no. down the highway. <laughs> yeah, but that's it. I mean, that was, that was about the, you know. So, so you've all said, Len, go ahead. You let mm -hmm. me say something about oh. Leonard. Uh, then, uh, when I came back from that experience at ADCO, Leonard and I were friends, and I told him about it. Since what year? <laughs> that was 1957, <laughs> we're friends. Let's keep the record straight. <laughs> <laughs> and well, then, I, so I take credit, really, for him getting started in all this and the way he's gone all, yeah. almost, almost to Indianapolis 500. Yes. And, and Len, you obviously have a huge passion for automobile racing. And one of the things that has struck me throughout all of your stories, right, is that there was this tension. It wasn't all roses. Um, there were challenges. And I think that we would all appreciate the uh, learning more about Vargo specifically, because Vargo was such an important part of the story. And then if you could tell us where places that weren't as accommodating as Vargo, what that was like. So can we talk a little bit about Vargo and then other places? The Vargo racetrack started in 1959 and it ended in 1969 or 1970. Uh, uh, Vargo Dragway was a Shangri-La in this particular area of the, of the country. Uh, Jake Vargo, the owner of the drag strip, which is up here at 3131 Elephant Road in Percocy, wanted everyone to come and, and race at his track. So when John Griswold got me to go up, up there first to change the tires and help him with the timing of his, his car, I noticed that it was just different than any other uh, place in America at that particular time. Uh, all the men and all the drivers up there, I would say were 60% were Army veterans, including, including Bill and, and myself. More and, and, John, and, John, and John Griswold, an all Army veteran. Most of the veterans, most of the veterans that came out and did these innovative cars and like Bill did, were very mature for the ages. And we didn't have a lot of silly stuff go uh, uh, going on. And everyone, because they've been army veterans and most of them were like infantry. And uh, Bill, for example, he was special forces in Korea and, and uh, he's wearing his 101 Airborne hat here, t here today. So, so everyone was trying to help each other, even, to, even against sometimes their own <laughs> good intentions, would lend you parts, would do things. So you didn't hear any racial slurs or ethnic slurs. So the farmers around here, they were, they were a different story. The farmers went to uh, Mr. Vargo, and he says uh, uh, they'd see uh, Bill and Huck re re going down the road in the truck to the next racetrack to make money the same day, working on their cars. And they, and they said, we don't want these people up here. These people are, are going to steal things and so on, et cetera. So Jake Vargo straightened out everyone, and he said, you know, everybody played, goes by the rules at this racetrack. They can, they can race here. So that, by being introduced into that type of situation prepared me for all of the things that came after it. But that was, that was the most ideal racing uh, that, uh, we, that, that I have ever been involved with. And, and on top of that, Bill Young, Bill, Bill was very innovative, and he was running the records, like top, like double A fuel records. And here he's he, he's he's African American, and I could see what Bill could do. Then I knew I had a long way to go to get there. So that gave that gave me 
uh, in, uh, in, in, inspiration. And so, so that's why uh, I was really proud of uh, Corey Amsler here at the museum when uh, I was interviewed two or three years ago and I said to Corey, I said, Corey, there's another uh, forgotten African-American pioneer that was good was was a, it was a record holder up at Vargo and Corey says no kidding so Corey did more research and and and, and I brought Bill up here to, uh, twice to uh, to, uh, to the mu museum and and it's a distinct pleasure to see that that Bill has an exhibit down there beside mine because he did a great job here and a lot of things in the in the African American community we stress one thing but they're great heroes that have done other things and I think we need to give him another hand yeah. for what he did. I still can shift better than you. <laughs> I can go fast with you. Guess what? I take that. That's my <laughs> <laughs> But uh, so that's that that's that's the uh, that's our thing is at, at Vargo and the the other there's some funny things. So I make very funny things. Ken Wright, who I grew up with, he's on the next uh, panel. He was like, in, uh, he called up the Vietnam Air Naval Rescue, so Kenny can pack a chute. Bill, he, Bill was bad packing a, 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 a parachute. So, so him and, so there was a fellow in the 82nd Airborne, he could pack the chute, so he messed with Bill. He messed, he messed, with him. so he would pack the chute loose, and a, and a dragster come down there at 190 miles an hour, and, and, it, and it would stop at a different place. And sometimes Huck would go into the cornfield <laughs> because he fool, he did he messed with the shoot on 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 purpose. According to what he how he felt. According to how he felt. So so we went through all all of those uh, various uh, situations, but. Uh, Vargo was a special place, folks, and you would never know it if, uh, if this museum had not brought it to light. You just never would think that was outstanding racing like that. Mm -hmm. Bill, I wondered if you could comment a little bit for us. When you think of Vargo, when you think of those days, what comes to mind for you? Well, Vargo was close, fairly close to home, but the way they accepted us, the way they treated us, it was nice. I mean, they didn't give you nothing, but the atmosphere was nice. <laughs> <laughs> you had your word for it. But uh, we were center of attraction, though. As soon as we pull up, the uh, crowd would stop to attention like they was playing the national anthem or something. Yes. And uh, yeah. we always made a good show, and we didn't always win, but uh, we were a threat. Mm -hmm. We were a threat mm -hmm. during the whole time we were racing. Mm -hmm. And uh, Huck, uh, one day, I got tired of driving. He was my pit man, and I said, you want to drive? He said, yeah. So I'd say, uh, go ahead. I got out of my driver's suit, gave it to him, and I'd say, look, before you leave, always check this pen and make sure you see this pen before you leave the starting line. Okay, okay, okay. So that was it, end of conversation. So he got in the car, and he made a pass and he looked good, and at this way I could hear the car running. And it sounded good to me, but it should be a little better. But anyway, he got carried away. He got good. He was he was cutting the tree, the tree pretty good then. The lights had come down. He was cutting them down, and he looked very promising, he looked good. But one day he got carried away. Pulls up to the line, asking was it okay? Yeah. The pen was still in the chute. Yes, yes. He wound up in the cornfield. Yes, yes, yes. So the ambulance driver rushed over to me and says, come on, get in and we go down. What do I want to go down there for? He's okay. I don't make the car to stop. Yes. I make it to run. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but we had 
had good times, yeah, though, yeah. honest. Yeah. 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 And so I think a lot of us might wonder a couple of things. How do you think the African-American community at the time saw you? And then how did the greater community see you? Did you have a sense of that? John? We didn't have time to Yeah, I'll say I, Back there then, you practiced on Wednesday nights and you raced on Saturday. And so you were out of the community, really, because you worked right. on your car in the other right. times right. and so forth. And I, I don't know anybody other than like Len and other people who were in drag races that really knew what, was, what it was all about here. I don't think they even paid attention, nor it existed and so mm -hmm. forth. We found that when John and I, John and I were in the social circles at that particular time, and John and I really talked more about the racing on the sidebar, because in the, in the black community with a different cult, different culture in the 1950s and 60s because of the hardships on jobs and job promotions, in the black community in general, you did your job, watch what you said, and, don't try, and not get fired. <laughs> so then on the weekends, everyone lets loose and everybody can talk and do things on their own terms. Whereas us racers, well, we're doing things on working all night, trying to make the car go faster and everything, and that did not go over, uh, uh, go over, over well at, at all. But when I could go down to like Butch Clap Saddle over here, which, I grew, uh, which really got me going, but I could go like the Butch's gas station like in the 50s and all, and we would talk about carburetors. But Bill would show me things and do things, so we're two different cultures two distinct cultures where, where uh, uh, Bill Young just kept it quiet. Bill stayed to himself. Bill's like a genius. <laughs> he, uh, him and Huck, they like stayed to themselves mostly. John and I stayed, we were in both camps. We were in, uh, you know, we deal with white culture, we deal, deal with black culture, which were, were two different things, especially in, in, in that era, era. We would win races Rose would know, or a couple of our friends would know, we, I, but I never even even mentioned. We maybe, <laughs> you know, winning races because really it, it was just a different culture. They hear the basketball or the baseball or something, but and you talk about racing going 190 miles an hour, people tell you to quit. You need to be in. It's <laughs> right. <laughs> said quit. So that's it's just two different cultures. And so part of the time period, there were challenges. And I think it's important um, to talk about those. So when you think about the challenges, and John, I'll start with you. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, at each drag strip, you had to have your car inspected. So if you talked to some other dragsters before you went to a particular strip, they would sort of tell you, hey, look, you know, don't, don't let them know you got cutouts on your car or something like that. Or, or just like when I had that seatbelt experience. That didn't mean there were other people at that time running in that code without seatbelts. Right. But I had to go get my seatbelts. I couldn't run at all that day, so forth. So we, you, we had those little, those little things. I can remember I went up to York County uh, uh, drag strip and uh, when you went to the inspection station, they said, are you really going to run? That's what you wanted that with that car? I said, yeah, it's all set, it's all ready to go, and so forth. And uh, they forgot they were able, and they didn't even look under it afterwards. They gave me all these questions and so forth, and that was the first time I had run with a car with cutouts on. And you would, <laughs> between, your, between your muffler, uh, between your uh, exhaust header and your muffler, you wanted to bypass that muffler because the muffler would take away from your speed. Mm, five so what horsepower. You, so what you, what you would do, you would go to a shop and the guy would take a welding torch, cut your exhaust pipe in half, take a section out of it, and put in a two inch cast iron pipe and then weld that into it. But it had screw threads on the end, then you would put a cap on that. So during the day or the week you're driving your car, it's just like an ordinary car. 
But when you got to the drag strip, you unscrewed those two caps off your exhaust, and that gave us, he just said, a lot more horsepower. And you maybe, with, in my particular classification, I used to drag an F-stock automatic. Yep. And an F-stock automatic, if you could hit 15 seconds in a quarter of a mile, you were doing great. My, my record was 14.7 with a 65 yeah. Plymouth Barracuda. <laughs> yeah. Bill, tell us about some of the challenges that you were talking about earlier. <laughs> the challenge. Every time we went to a race, it was a challenge that we celebrated after the race. We had a good time when we stopped at a restaurant or something to eat after the race was over. We just have a good time. That's, that was it. A couple of times we went to one restaurant, I remember, on the turnpike. Management called the uh, state trooper in on us. It was a group of us. And we were sitting there having a good time. So the people in the restaurant, they were having a good time too, watching us clown. So anyway, the state trooper come in and uh, management talked to the trooper. The trooper came over to him and says, okay, where's the dog at? So <laughs> smart me, what dog? What are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. So the people knew who was barking and raising hay. So they were all laughing. And the trooper looks around, he sees everybody. That, he said, make sure you see the dog the next time, and the trooper walked out. That yeah. was it. We had fun. We laughed coming in and laughed going out. Huck, I know that there's some stories about even physically leaving Philadelphia uh, to get to Vargo. Is that something that you could tell us a little bit about? To the riot there. Yeah, well, yeah. what you be telling me? Yeah. No, you tell her. That's the sad part. Right. <laughs> yeah, we used to have little problems with, um, I think it was called Liquish, it was Liquish, um, I forgot the name of the company was in Camden, that uh, we had to go through the riots. Um, but they didn't, it was like, it wasn't like a riot. It was just protesting us trying to get to the track. You know, um, when we was going to, what was it, what was it? Um, What's in, what is that, 626? Is that where you go where, you go across the, the, the uh, Benjamin Franklin Bridge where it merges into 42? Is that 626 there, right coming through Camden? Yeah. Oh, that's 676, yes, yes, yes. But uh, we had a little problem in there. Um, they tried to stop us from coming to go across the Walt Whitman Bridge at one time, and then at the tracks, like down south, like I was saying earlier, Cecil County, no, not Cecil County, um, <laughs> my brain's locking up. Um, yeah. Capital. Capital, Capital. Capital, right, the Capital. Capital. They wouldn't let us race there. Um, one time, and then the following year, they sent us uh, a, a voucher to come back. $25. A $25 to help us with our <laughs> transportation. And the, uh, and, and the can echo we... one time they stopped me from racing there because I, w I was too young. I was supposed to have been, what well, they said, you had to race in Jersey 18, I was 16. And, but I had been running there about six months prior to that until one of the guys, you know, we were winning then, so then one of the guys, he tried to find something to disqualify us with, and then they, you know, they stopped me from racing in Jersey. But other than that, like I said, I was just, I was so young until all I wanted to do was go fast. Mm -hmm. I didn't care about, I really didn't have to stop. The, the thing was just to get, be the first one to lead the line and the first one across the finish line. So I didn't really see too much of the prejudice because you know, I was either on, under the hood working, I mean, you know, on the back of the trailer work, working on a car or working on a car at the track. The little prejudices that kind of was over my head. You, you remember know? the time we went to Baltimore Capitol? <coughs> And uh, there was two lines when you pull into the track, they had two lanes, and they inspect your car right. before you go in the track. So we pulled up with Muller, that was my toe piece, with NACP on the side. And there's a group of inspectors there. They see us, so where the line is, we right up head of the line. This line don't move no more. We at the head of the line. This line is moving a car at a time, a car at a time. So they must have called timeout, and all the inspectors got together in a little huddle, 
and they look over at the car going along. That one guy, he was a volunteer. He walked over and said, you boys can't run that thing here. So I said, why? Because we said so. Yes, so right. I said, okay, let's go. Yeah. So we left. We left. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then they sent me $25 the next year and invited us down to Baltimore yeah. County. We had a couple <laughs> tracks done that. Yeah, it was a couple tracks. $25. Mm -hmm. We got to come from Philly all the way down. The Baltimore, <laughs> all that, that part of Maryland anyway. But they were part of the good times. <laughs> Well, I think part of it, too, is your resilience. Part of these story, everything that I hear in these stories is that no one was going to stop you. No one was going to slow you down. No one was going to take that joy of racing away from you. And this is a testament to it, right? It's 2018, and you've got an avid audience hanging on to your every word because the spirit of what you all were doing in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and beyond is alive, and we feel it. Am I right? Do we all feel it? Yeah. yeah. Glenn. I have a story off the track. You'll see in my exhibit downstairs the license plate Pennsylvania 100 UA. Uh, that was the uh, well, that was part of my 40 Ford Club Coupe convertible that Butch helped me work on for many a night. My uh, cousin, Buddy Holmes in Essex County, Virginia, calls me up and he says, Lenny said, these rebels are intimidating our uh, black drivers on Route 17 because in those days it was very hard uh, in, in Virginia for a black person to pa pass a white person in a car, especially if you're going to go 60, 70, 80 miles an hour past them, and the, they, the guy saw harass you a little bit. So he said, I want you to come down here, come down here and teach these guys a lesson. So I took the 44 Club Coupe convertible, had a Mercury engine, Lincoln transmission, Ford, uh, it could go fast, it's fast. <laughs> so but, uh, Buddy Holmes and I pulled up into this SO station where these uh, guys were hanging out. So I pulled up in there and I said, uh, I want to reach that 49 Ford Club Coupe convertible. Buddy said, you're crazy to ask a couple of pulling in there like that. So the man comes up to me, one of the guy's bib overhauls, looking like something out of the movie Deliverance. <laughs> <laughs> comes up to me, there's about nine guys around there, and he said, here, he didn't know what to call me, the N-word or Negro, so he, com he made a combination. He said, we got a Negro <laughs> here from Pennsylvania. And he said, uh, what do you want, boy? I said, I want to race that car over there. Mm -hmm. He said, okay. <laughs> so they get, so this boy John comes out and we met up at uh, where everyone knows where Route 301 and Route 17 uh, uh, meets crosses in, in Virginia. So meet me up there, you meet, meet us up there tomorrow and we're gonna race the finish line, which was like two miles was there a uh, SO station on, on, the, on, the, on the corner of this hill. So I went up there with Buddy and I, and one of their guys was riding with the other fella, and we put on, we put on, I, I mean, we're ready to die. It was this, it, 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 was, it, was, it was NASCAR type, it, 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 tap your bumper, move you over, you know, we're gonna dump you down the, down the side of the road. So we got it on for the two miles. And at the end, I had, I had extra motor on him. And when I passed that gas station, I, I won that race. <laughs> right past that gas station. And all these guys in bib overhauls looking at it like they're out of deliverance. <laughs> they, looked at, they looked at me, but he says, we're gonna get lynched. Keep going. <laughs> so, 
So I say, I said, buddy, I'm going back. I did a 180. I pulled that, boom, I pulled back up in there. The guy, the leader says, he said, what's your name, boy? I said, uh, Lenny Miller. He said, he said, that's a mighty fine drive. He said, I never seen no, no Yankee or Negro drive like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then, he, and then he put his hand in, and I learned something that day. He put his hand inside, inside the coop and he says, he said, you can come by here and you can get gas anytime. And he said, I'll let you use the bathroom too. <laughs> That was my story. <laughs> now, before we first give these panelists a huge round of applause, I want to I want to leave you with a final question. Mm -hmm. And my question is this: In telling these stories, John and Bill and Huck, especially because I know Len's staying for part two, what impact do you think sharing these stories has with today's audiences? Do you think it has an impact? I do. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's news. They never knew that it existed because they weren't part of it. Right. Yes. Yeah, being part of it, you you know yeah. how how it felt, how you felt, and you knew what the outcome was. And this is the first time we get to talk about it. You know, so many people that don't even know what drag racing is. You know yes. about NASCAR. You know, round and around the track. But just going down an eighth of a mile or a quarter of a mile track, stri strip, people just don't know about it. So this, I'm sure if I asked you to raise your hand if you've ever been to a drag strip, maybe we would get two hands out there, or how many we would get. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, all the family people, right? <laughs> And along that line, I can't speak to my family because I don't think they ever would go to this drag strip with me. <laughs> Huck, do you ever think about that impact? Uh, I, well, I'm, I don't talk that much. You know, I'm, just like I told you the last time I was oh. up here, you kind of got me going the last time because it's like I have so many flashbacks of things that I went through racing, you know, but I, I, I just hope that nobody had to go through that. I hope that's what they got out of that. Mm -hmm. If they can see it coming or see the prejudice a mile away, then you go around the corner, unless you're a fighter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it. How does it make you all feel to share these stories? Oh, it makes me feel good. It makes me feel good, <laughs> yeah. That I'm still here. Well, it makes us feel good to have shared their stories today. There are plenty more. This is not where it ends. This is just the beginning of the conversation. So I want a huge round of applause for John, Bill, and Huck as they make their way off the panel. <laughs> And the next part of our program, I know that Len Miller wanted to say a few words before we showed you the trailer for a film, a documentary called Silent Thunder. Shameless plug, there is an amazing book downstairs in the museum shop called Silent Thunder. I want everyone to get a copy. All of these gentlemen are going to sign it. There is a documentary film about these gentlemen. And Len, I'm going to tee you up. Thank you, Bill. You'll, you, in the trailer you're about to uh, see, I wanted to uh, point, make a, a couple of points I want you to, to look at. You'll see uh, Jane Castain uh, uh, talking on, uh, on this trailer. She was the first
female sports caster in the United States on TV, radio, etc. Major. The comments she she made were based on what she saw and experienced. She has she has seen Benny Scott and that Viceroy car downstairs and other cars that we have in the trials and tribulations that we went in. So watch Jane Castain uh, on, in the tra trailer. You'll see, you'll see a picture of, and I, you'll see it also on these posters of Grant King. Uh, Grant King was our, our crew chief. He was the best Chinese mechanic in the world, whether it be mainland China or or the United States or Canada. He was he was equal to ten or fifteen uh, uh, regular American mecha mechanics. So I wanted to make a mention of him. And the at the end of the trailer, you'll see a fellow will come on and say, you know, what happened? How was the plug pull? Well, that, that older gentleman, he came up to me at the Long Beach Grand Prix in 1975, and I took time with him and explained to him what racing was about. And he went on to college and became one of the big electrical engineers in the whole state of Cal California just because of the exposure to us and our big race car. The race car downstairs is not, is not the biggest race cars and the fastest race car we've ever had. We've had cars double that. But I would like you just to mentally to take note of that. Thank you. Thank you, Len. Yeah. There was Jackie Robinson in baseball. There was Wendell Scott in NASCAR, but Leonard Miller was able to take it to a whole new level. I think if you look back uh, across uh, history and you look at the contributions that Lynn Miller and his Black American Racers team made, uh, you know, it can't be underscored enough that uh, this was truly a pioneering effort. They're doing something that simply wasn't done at this scale, at this level previously, by Black Americans. <laughs> Cars ran at 140 or 150 miles an hour, inches apart. When a black driver gets into any racing series, it's a wild card. Whites couldn't even perceive blacks in auto racing, especially at the, at the top levels. We were proud to run as black American racers. They had a mission to try to break the race barrier in racing. It's so difficult for a black racing team to break into the sport. It takes such a ton of money. You're not gonna go racing for 10 bucks. We had Kenny Wright driving Mr. Diplomat. Anything that made a lot of horsepower and a lot of noise and went faster, I loved it. My father was working with a driver in Los Angeles called Benny Scott, and he drove a you know, 190 mile per hour Grand Prix car. I've raced for probably five years, and this is the first time in my racing career that I've actually had first-class equipment. We just set uh, four lap records at Laguna Seca Monterey. This was kind of history in itself in that this is the first time that a black driver sat on the pole. Uh, articles were written in magazines such as Auto Week, Car and Driver, of course, Ebony Magazine did a, a feature on Benny, which I think was very solid. And I was like, wow, these guys are in a in Playboy magazine. This was a major inroad into what had been historically for the preceding 70 years, essentially an all-white dominated sport. What I saw was a team on the up, moving up, and then all of a sudden the plug was pulled. So you pull the plug, why? And I'd love to ask Mr. Ron Hines and Mr. Ken Wright to join us up here. 
So in that trailer, we heard some really interesting snippets, and it took me read, uh, watching it over and over again to pick up on some things. So some things that I would love these gentlemen to illuminate for us. Did you hear Benny Scott say it was the first time that a black man or black person was in the poll position? We want to hear more about that. Did you see the number 22 Viceroy car in that footage? Ladies and gentlemen, that is the car that is downstairs in this lobby as we speak. The history that is in this building right now, both living and through artifacts, cannot be replicated. P.S. It's only here until September 9th, so I highly encourage you to tell people you know about this history that you're learning here today. But I want a warm welcome for our two new panelists, Ron Hines and Ken Wright. Thank you. And Len, I want to set this over to you. Give us the scene. Why that car? Why Monterey, California? Tell us why this is important. Uh, before we... Or Madam, Len, anywhere you want to go. Madam, Madam General, please. <laughs> I would like Ron and Ken to take a little time to talk about how they got involved, we all got involved together, and et cetera, and I will dutifully go to it. Uh, my interest in, in automobiles started when I was 11 years old. I grew up in New Rochelle, New York, and it, I don't know how it hit me, but I, was, I, I lived near, a place, uh, near City Park. Anybody who knows anything about New Rochelle, there's City Park. Fifth Avenue comes up the street. And I was on that street, and I saw this 1948 Plymouth coupe with a chopped top. And I said, man, that thing looks pretty neat. So, and, and it turned out to be for sale. I had a paper route. So I took my paper route money that I had saved, $40. I went over and offered $40 for the car. And, and the, the owner sold it to me. It didn't run, the engine was apart, everything, but it was parts and pieces. But that was my, my start to liking cars. Because my dad saw it, he said, get that car, I'm 11 years old. Get that car right back up the street, you can't keep that. So uh, that was my start, and I, and, I, and I liked cars ever since that time. And I was lucky enough and fortunate enough to go to uh, Phillips Academy in uh, Andover, Massachusetts, and the Phillips Academy. And um, I roomed with a, a youngster at the time, we're all young, named John Cox. And he, would, he was a car enthusiast from Terre Haute, Indiana. He would subscribe to a car magazine called Rod and Custom. And at that time, the magazine was this, this size. And on the front was a 1934 Ford. I said, man, that's something similar to the one I had, you know, the car I had. And I said, I'd like to get that. I'd like to have something like that. But we talked about that all the time. So I graduated from, from, uh, from uh, Phillips Academy and went to the University of Pennsylvania. After that, studied engineering. And um, there were guys on, in, in I, I happened to join a fraternity, Cap Alpha Psi, and the, the Ooh. Ooh. The we frat bring, house was in, 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 in the West, uh, West Philly, uh, Belmont Avenue, as I remember it. And we would see guys drag racing up and down the street. And, and I heard about Billy, as a matter of fact, about the same time. Somebody said, there's this, this guy out there. He, he tests his dragster on the street. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. <laughs> well, I, I didn't have, I was a student, I didn't have the wherewithal to go, you know, find him or see where he was, but that's, you know, that's the kind of um, interest that kept, kept me going. I was fortunate enough to graduate from Penn, and uh, in the early, when did I meet you, in 1970 what? Yes, 1971. He, he was, and now we're in 2018. <laughs> anyway, 
He had, he had the idea of, of starting a, a, an association called Black American Racers Association, which was intended to put out into the, into the public what black folks were doing in auto racing. And not only that, to encourage them to get sponsorships and, 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 and recognize uh, racers such as Wendell Scott and, uh, and, 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 uh, and uh, name some other, Red, a, 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 a pioneer racer from the Gold, what was it called, the Gold Cup Series back in the- The Indiana, uh, the Gold, uh, uh, Red Sumner Oliver for Indianapolis, Indiana. And there's some Indiana folks in here today. Go ahead. Yeah. And so, they can explain you know, it. It, the idea of Black American Race Association was to give some recognition to these pioneers uh, of racing. So, <coughs> Leonard, of course, didn't know in the beginning that I was, you know, into the mechanics of it. I could tune cars, I could modify cars, and I actually drag raced. To, you know, my, my, I eventually bought a 1933 Ford, which I still have. And, um, I raced that car, so I didn't mind getting my hands dirty and, 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 and greasy. So when he started, went into the racing, the road racing with uh, the car you saw downstairs, he asked me to join the team, become the crew chief and mechanic. Crew chief means you get to work on the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you point to somebody to fix something, you are pointing to yourself. Ron, so, let, Ron let me interject uh, something, Dylan, which was also unique. Ron, having gone to Phillips Academy up there with George Bush and those guys, yeah, two, Ron, Ron, at Phillips Academy and the University of Pennsylvania and black American racers made a rare combination in him. Ron could get out from under the car, put a motor together, and we had to write a proposal. He wrote the proposal like Gloria Brown in here writes proposals, impeccable, impeccable English, which you don't have to correct on a yellow pad <laughs> And then go back and put on and, and, and wrench the car. That's that's a phenomenal. Uh, uh, that's like phenomenal that that he could help me do that. So, that's what. Go ahead, Ron. Finish quickly. So, so anyway, that's so that's how I became part of the team. And if you if you think about, you heard Billy talk about his experience with, the, with drag racing, I could see by the, the history that he, that he started, he wasn't worried, really in his mind, yes, he, he knew he was black. You look in the mirror every morning, he's still black, you know that. And when he went racing, some of the ways he was treated, they reminded him that he was black. But his focus was on going fast and winning races. And I heard this story about Little Huck walking past the shop and going inside here and all this noise and everything. And then at some point, he, was, he, he thought he could drive the car. When he finally got to drive it, he was faster, he was better at it than Billy. That was later on. But um, uh, the point I'm getting to is that you're really focused on winning or doing the very best you can. You didn't care that you, you didn't look and say, well, I'm part of history. No, we wanted to win. We did everything in our mm -hmm. heart, soul, to get, that, to get Benny to run up front. And he, he did very, he, he all but won a race at Laguna Seca. But in other, in all the other races around the country, you saw the photo, some of the footage he was right up there with the, with the best of them. That was a very, very difficult series, a very, very competitive series. Mm -hmm. And we had to keep that car absolutely the best that it could be in, in, or, in order to, um, to be successful. Mm -hmm. yeah.
my name is Kenneth Wright. I'm officially Len's, after him, second driver. <laughs> and we won the New Jersey State Champion in 1970, but Len and I go back, way back, to when I was probably 11, 10. His brother was my best friend growing up. And cars were just something that I always loved from the time I was a little kid. <clears throat> The first race I was involved with, I wasn't really involved, I was a passenger. My grandfather, who lived in Malvern, Pennsylvania, raced a train because I asked him to. <laughs> this is way back in the early 40s. I was a little kid, could just stand up and look over the seat. And I said, can you catch that train, Grandpa? And away he went. And up Route 30, the train tracks run beside it, and I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. And then I, his brother I knew real well, Dexter, I said he was my best friend. I would go visit him, see Len. Len was always just a great guy, a gentleman. And I remember when he got his 1940 Ford. And it was another friend of ours, his name was Buddy Sparrow. He had a Chevrolet, a 47. And they both had these cars fixed up these loud exhaust pipes on them. <clears throat> I think I was maybe 13, 14 maybe. And they backed their cars up to each other and to see who could make the most noise. And I thought that was the greatest thing in the world, <laughs> to hear all that noise. <laughs> it would actually make my heart beat faster. <laughs> so anyway, time passed and uh, the first time I went to a race was at York Dragway, I went to see the great driver, um, <clears throat> Don Garless, and it was a local Chevrolet mechanic, uh, Bill, Grumpy. Bill Grumpy Jenkins. Sorry, I'm a little slow right now, but he was great. I watched those guys race. They raced on an airport. When the planes would land, they would have to stop <laughs> racing. And after the plane landed, they would race again. And watching those guys race just was like a thrill. I brought that back, I guess I was 15 at the time, <clears throat> and I said, I got to have a car. I bought a car when I was 15 years old. Mm -hmm. Car ran a little bit. <laughs> when I got my license, I drove it, I think, six months, and it broke down. <laughs> bought another one. Had, a little, had to do some work on that. I actually had to go buy parts from Ardmore, take them back on a bus, bring those parts home, got the car running, and drove that until I started back to school where the car broke again, so I had to finish my year out without a car. But anyway, I was working at a drugstore, and Len had went into the military, and I was on my way home from work one night. This car pulls up beside me. Look over and it's Len. He said, Come on, I'll take you home. He was had his uniform on, and it was a nineteen fifty-two or fifty-three Nash or Hudson Hornet. Hudson Hornet. And that car was just as sleek back then. <laughs> and we talked on the way back as he, when he drove me home, and I said, Man, this Len is a great car. Then I was hooked. From then on, all I wanted was an automobile. Dexter and I were good, and we were just great friends. Len was, he inspired us all. We bought cars, bought parts for him, fast car parts, and. Went to college, studied. Well, that was a little later, but. Yeah. <laughs> it was just, my mechanic. world was an automobile. I didn't care about anything else. My first book, sadly to say, was a automotive textbook. <laughs> the English teacher wanted me to read history and math and all these other things. <laughs> I didn't care. But anyway, things worked out. I graduated high school. And then after uh, meeting Len, and especially Ron, it sort of made me think, you know, maybe you really need to think about other things that are important. But all during that time, I had been building cars, <clears throat> my own personal cars. and driving in the street when I was in service, I had a Corvette. I bought that in 63, and 
I went in the Navy in 1964. I got stationed at Lakehurst, New Jersey. And on the way back one day, a guy had a Mustang. And he beat me. I said, wait a minute. This is no good. So when I got back, I got out of service. The first thing I did, I went to a Chevy dealer and bought a brand new Chevrolet motor, put it in the Corvette, which I knew was super fast at the time. Next time I saw a Mustang, that was it. It was gone. <laughs> so time passed, and Dex and I would go to the track, and then we went and met with Len one time. Actually, we went to a picnic, and Len was there. And um, it was at your dad's house. Mm -hmm. And you started talking about building a race car. <clears throat> and I said, well, whatever you guys want to do. Well, we got a 55 Chevy. I'm not sure. What junkyard. Was, yeah, it was right out of the junkyard. And at that time, I started teaching a boat at a boat tech school <clears throat> in Philadelphia called the Kennedy Center. We towed the car down to school. We tore the car all apart, mm -hmm. painted the car all up. And when the car was all done, we were ready to go racing. And the first half of season, we didn't do too well. He had did a lot of excellent work to it, but for some reason, the car wasn't running properly. Well, the following year, in 1969, we got the bugs out of it, and that car was right from then on. Yeah. And it was all uphill after that. Yeah. We, we won 35 races that year. Wow. Mm. And we were top 10 in the state of New Jersey. And we had raced the first time a black and a first, first time, time black team. Right. First time that a black team had won. And it was really, Len thought the car up because we had other ideas. He said, no, let's do it this way. He had thought this automobile up, the engine, everything. Yeah. And that car yeah. ran a record every time I run down. It was only one race I messed up on and never told Len. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I lost that race, but I'll tell you what happened. Yeah. We were down at Atco, and I think I was racing a, um, a little six-cylinder Valiant. Valiant. When the light changed, I pulled out ahead of him, but the seat broke. Oh. <laughs> And I couldn't reach the clutch. <laughs> and I'm holding on. Yeah. So I finally got the thing in gear, but the guy got past me and he beat me by a few seconds. That's the only race that I lost. But then after that, um, yeah. well, uh, I appreciate what uh, you did yeah. too. Track after we won that track championship, in the following year, Len decided to go to a bigger car. So we went to a '69 <clears throat> Mustang. Cam which was Camaro. a really powerful car, but I didn't drive because I had three children at the time, and you know, just things didn't work out for me to be the driver. So anyway, from that car, they went to the Super V. And then I started working back with them with the Super V, mm -hmm. and then um, we went to Lime Rock. Everywhere. Texas, Watkins Glen, Spent many hours changing tires and not eating meals and being in the hot sun and getting sunburnt. And yeah. Eating good beans, food and yeah. beans. And <laughs> just was a great time, but it was really a highlight of my life and I really enjoyed that part. And I got to thank Len because if it wasn't for Len, I'd have never had the opportunity to drive. I was driving on the street yeah. at night, yeah. but not on a track. I couldn't afford to do the things that you need to do to get a, a car like Billy did. And I used to watch Billy run and also, um, huh. no, John. Oh, oh, John. No. John, don't remember, but I watched him run. So, and I watched Huck. But I enjoyed a whole time race and I wish I could have kept doing it, but life changes you and you just do different things. So, but Len, he hung in there for years, and I got to thank him for my opportunity to drive for him. Yeah, and you're Alpha Phi Alpha, not Kappa. <laughs> <That's for sure>. <laughs> <laughs> oh! Oh! Hey, hey. <laughs> so, 
So Len, is now a good time to ask about the Super V in Monterey? You see, you see, you see on the uh, program about Monterey, California, May 4th, 1975. I'm going to tell this story uh, in its entirety, It'll only take a few, a few minutes. Uh, when, as Ron said, we got running with the Super V, we ran in the top 10 in points in the United States for like three years. And every race was, was, was really, really tough with, with class problems and racial problems centered around it. But the May 4th, uh, 1975 was starting Starting on the first of first of May, uh, Freddie and Ernie Howard, which were were one of the wealthiest African Americans on the West Coast at that time, I drove with them. They wanted to show off their new Aust uh, Jensen Healy. The Jensen Healy rare uh, rare car has a has a bathtub look in the in in, in the back. So I. Just, sent a team on and we rode down to Monterey from Oakland. And when we come, come into Monterey Peninsula on the, on, the, on the highway there by the ocean, I saw the Viceroy, a Viceroy placard, a big banner, like floating out to sea. I said, ugh, that's not good. So we went, to the, we went to the Viceroy's uh, office, because I always like to check in to let them know we're in town and everything is all right with the racing team. And the Viceroy uh, rep said, uh, Leonard, he said the Camels the rep went through Monterey, California, paid a college student $100 and took all our banners down, ripped them all, all down. He said, now tonight, I got a college student. I'm going to go down and rip all the camel bags. <laughs> so that's how this started. So we go. I want to check in with the team to see how the, you know, everything is situated right. So we pull up to the VIP special parking for owners, car owners only. Pull up with the Jensen Healy, got this big VIP sign in the window. He doesn't open the gate. He honked the horn, doom, doom, doom. He wouldn't open the gate. So the security guard comes over, he says, you people go over, you have to park in the public, this is for car owners. So Ernie Howard says, he's driving. Ernie said, here's the owner sitting here. He said, no, that can't be possible. There's no black owners ever own any cars like this. He said, you people go to the stands. So I'm getting ready to get out and fight. And I'm just getting ready to get, just get right out. That was it. So the PR VP comes by. She says, that's Len Miller. He owns the car. Open the gate. Let the people in. So we got through that. So the next day, I want to back up one minute and talk about that there's a gear. For that particular car downstairs, there's a first gear that only five were made. I know Eddie's in the audience here. Eddie Riotti would like this. There's five gears made that can take you through turn nine coming out to the straightaway at nine miles an hour faster than the normal first gears in that particular car. So in a road race, like at, at, at Monterey, Kenny will tell you, I always figure out the race courses and everything. I want to know every turn and, and, and what it needs. So on a straightaway with that car downstairs, it's 150 miles an hour on flat out speed. So when you come down to turn nine, you've got to get down to 25 miles an hour, bring it all the way into first gear, and then come out, then come out again. So this first gear, that there are only five in the world, would bring you through turn nine, this is very important, and 
turn nine, and I could get nine miles an hour coming past. I could, we can pass on the turns at, at, at the low speeds when other, other people couldn't. Long story short, I tell no one except Benny Scott, the driver, about the gear. And this is, this is the difference of being an owner and a, and, a, and a team manager and knowing everything about your race car. Secretly, I, t I, I give it to the team. I, I tell the mechanic to put this new first gear in. What do you want to do that for, Mr. Miller? I have to put the gear, put the first gear in. That's so no one else knows I have the secret because all the people talk. The mechanics are, we got to, oh, you know. <laughs> they don't want all that. We're going to have a secret. <laughs> so practice comes the next day on Friday, folks. Friday is the practice. Stop watch. I said, gee, we're the fastest car on the track. There's 60 cars. 40 make the field. So you have people go far as away as New Zealand come to race. People come from Australia to race in the series. Right, Ron? And oh, what, yeah. Well, we race. They come the from Germany and, and everything. So you, you have to qualify for stringent uh, a competition for 40 spots. Where are we? We're the fastest car on the track because of the gear I just told you about. So the, so the PR lady, the vice president of the track, she comes down, uh, Len, you need to go up to the office and to talk to the track manager. He's, ca he's calling, he's calling all, all you colored guys out of your name. I said, really? <laughs> he's calling you out of your name and, and they're starting a lot of a, a monkey business here. I go up to the track office, the rules will tell you I'm aggressive, aggressive. I go up to the track office, I ask, what, what is the problem here? I'm mean, having problems with all. So the Camels representative, Camels had paid $250,000 for the rights to, you know, have the banners up, the radio, you know, everything everybody in, 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 the, in the audience knows about. So, so the track manager, which was a transport, he, he was a transplanted NASCAR type, he says to me, he says, young man, he says, I'm not going to announce anything on your race car except the number. I'm not going to mention, I'm not going to mention black American racers, Viceroy, Benny Scott, or you. That's what he says to me. Well, I, we had a huff and I, I slammed the door and went left. So we turned, so that, that set the stage. I knew what, what we're up, up against. So Saturday morning, we have qualifying. So 60 cars, 20 go home. If we're the fastest car on the track, we get the pole. And set a track record. It set, it set the track record. We, we lowered Mario and Andretti's record there on the, uh, on the qualifying. Thanks, Ron. Yeah. So we go. Oh. So, 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 the, so the VP, uh, the VP for, uh, for public relations says, wow, he said, get ready and change your clothes. At two o'clock in the afternoon, we're going to go to the uh, to the roses. Very familiar. We go to the hotel where they had a press conferences off site, and they have a big thing, you know, food and everything like that. So here we go, John. You would appreciate this. Here we go. We go down. We go down to the hotel. The parking lot's empty. This is where they told them that the meeting would be. Yes. So so said he it's goes a, to where they, where it was scheduled to be. Not yes, told him scheduled be to be, scheduled right? Scheduled to be there. So we get, to, so we go down there to park. I go in. I said, Benny, let me go in. This, this doesn't look right. I go in. The manager said, Len, they've changed the press conference and they made it three miles down the road. What, what the, what the manage, what the manager of the track did. 
he, there, were th there were two things he's fighting all, all along. One, a viceroy, Brown and Williamson Tobacco Company, comes in and ruins Camel's parade. Then we're, we're a black team, own team, and a, and, a, and a black driver, and the reporters were coming out of, well, I mean, reporters were coming out everywhere trying to, you know, interview us and, and so on. So he took the second place and third place drivers, had a phony press conference, mm. and put that on the television and knocked us out. Well, the responsibility I, I have, which Ken and seen me do it before, is I can't, I'm fighting racial problems, I'm fighting competition between two giant Fortune 500 company, companies. You know, I met another person that's out of the movie Deliverance, the track manager, he's from Texas. <laughs> there you go. And I'm fighting all these issues and I have to keep them within to keep us, to keep us uh, going. So what happened? I went back, we went back to the, uh, uh, we went back to the track and I said, uh, I said, Benny, we got a problem here. And it says, we got to pull the car out because we're going to have a tough run. So I got permission, which you're not supposed to do after you got the pole, to take your car out of the track because they're, they're, they're always to think well, you're going to change that something. Car. Yeah. They would sabotage that you car. You think you're sabotaging the car. So what I did is I took the team, and I don't tell the team all this, what I'm saying to you here today. Took the team down to the tomato factory. Some of you may know where the tomato factory is in Monterey, California. And they had these big lights, parking lights out there. And we took that race car and put it under the parking lots. And I sat on an orange crate until 1 a.m. in the morning. And worked the team. And we got that, we went over every nut and bolt and for that team so we can make, so we can really make a showing. So in the meantime, I had to get a secret hotel, hotel hotel room because the reporters were all in front of our hotel to the place that I couldn't, you can't think because everybody's running around. In fact, Fat Sam, he was the black reporter for, uh, from, from San Francisco and he had a radio show and he was running around here, I'm gonna call the brothers, we're gonna burn the place now. <laughs> so, so you got all this, all this stuff going on. So, so since I'm an Alpha Phi Alpha guy, what? So, yeah, <laughs> I'm an Alpha Phi Alpha guy. So, I go, I go back to room. I look, I look up at the ceiling, and I think of Rudolf Kipling's "If an Alpha Fraternity always told you to hold your head above the other." And I needed that because Ron wasn't there. Ken wasn't there. Benny, the driver, you want him ready to run. You don't want him getting caught up in civil rights politics. Let me, let me handle that. So I, 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 I looked at the ceiling and I said, jeez. So I, I called Mo Campbell, the vice president of, the, of our team, and I said, I want to see Benny at 5 o'clock in the, in the morning at this place, at this restaurant. So Benny meets me at five o'clock in the morning of the fourth for the race. He said, Benny, I said, you know, we're up against it. Uh, and I said, I never asked you all the years we've raced together. I said, we got to yeah, put it all on the line. I said, we're, we're going to have to drive all the way up to the pearly gates without going in. Mm -hmm. And he said, he said, Len, I'll do it on one condition. He said, you go tell my mother not to come to the track. So I went. 6 a.m., made Mrs. Scott up. And I told her, he said, Mrs. Scott, we're going through a, a terrible thing here at the track. And I said, we got to put it all on the line, not leave nothing. And, and I said, the, uh, Benny and I you know, asked if you could stay up back at the, at the Blue Lantern Hotel it was. And she, uh, her husband had been a, a racer, so she knew about racing and she said, look, 
She said, I'll stay home here. She said, I'll stay, Leonard, at the, at the ho hotel. She said, but you try not to bring my boy back in a box. And she said, she said, I want you and him to fight this by yourselves. She said, I, she said, I'll go on that condition. So I went, so went back that Ron wasn't with us, but Ron usually strapped Benny in over the, over the, all the time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so that meant that that meant it was him and I. I do the signals. They don't have anybody on the team to do the signals. It was him and I fighting the, the field. So I, I always trying to outthink the track manager. I had one of the team members go on the other side of the mountain with a walkie-talkie to the walkie-talkie on top of on top of our transporter. So he could tell me who was trying to push Benny and what was going on on the, on the, because you don't have television. You don't have all this stuff that you have today. So we get ready for, we get ready for the race. And I strapped Benny in and gave him what our strategy was. So the track manager, he wasn't through with me at all. He, he still got a long way to go. He pulled the pace car off the track. He said, he said, he said, you colored boys, he, he said, you take this field around. He said, if you make one mistake, I'm putting you to the rear of the field. You just mess my, he whispered to me that, going, so the pace car comes off, that means we have to manage the field. So Benny does like this, he says, what's up? Well, I can't tell him all, 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 the, all of this, I can't march and jump off the thing, we gotta keep going. So I said, take the field around slow, 35 miles an hour, let their carburetors load up, <laughs> so you're in control, you, you're, 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 your foot is in control, that when we can clean our car out, and they have to catch up to us. But the, but the track manager, he outsmarted me because Benny was going by the rules. So when the flag goes up, he lets the other, some of the other drivers jump the gun. So since he was trying to hurt us, he let them jump the gun and nine cars went right past us. So nine cars passed us on, on, on the first lap. So Benny tried to catch up and he, and he, and he, and he lost control of the car on the, on, on the coming around, and he came down the side of that mountain 150 miles an hour back, and he held on to that car, and he turned it around, and miraculously, he didn't put a scratch on that car. So what we did, what we did is him and I got to work. So, so we, we, got, we worked it, so next thing you hear, car 22 on lap eight, has lowered the track record, but set by Mario Andretti. He set the record down again so during they, the race. They, 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 so then we came around four or five more laps later. He said, now remember now, the track manager said that the announcer is not supposed to mention anything. He said, car 22 and Benny Scott hit the record again. He set the record down again. And then he said, and then the third thing he says, ben, we hit the record down again. I mean, we just put it in his face. So what happened? He says, Leonard Miller and Benny Scott are putting on a driving clinic. We've never seen anything like this, he said, with the black man. So then, so then, with two laps to go, that, that gear, we're going through that turn nine, we're making up distance, I mean, we're burning them up. So we came down with, with, with two, laps, two laps to go, Benny set the record down the fourth time, and he had to say Viceroy. He said, the, then the, I think he almost fired the announcer, because he said, said that, 
Viceroy comes on, and there's 30,000 people on their feet. We come around, we're in a photo finish. Now we got another problem. Photo finish. I dropped a pit card. I mean, Ron was the captain of the, of the, of the University of Pennsylvania track team. He can run way faster than I can. Was, I had to run down, sprint down there to the, to the finish line to make sure what? They didn't take the doctor to the thing or throw the photograph. But look, the guard didn't want to let me in. So uh, Volkswagen's wonderful in helping uh, uh, moral support and champion spark plug company during this, all this. So I get in there, folks, we lost the race by half an inch. I, I looked and he said, see you lost, see you lost. So I figure we lost, we're getting ready to go home. I go walk down to Benny and told him he was sick. So they said, uh, uh, car number, the one and corn, uh, the third place winner to the to the victory stand to get your trophies and your money, and we get you know, a few thousand dollars each. They said the second place car. Now the track manager went right back. He said the second place car, uh, Black American Racers, Viceroy, uh, Benny Scott, a uh, special will be go to the tech department for total tear down, we will not get, get their money. So, so we went to the, so we went to the tear down, and see we had that gear in there, but the gear was legal, and they, they didn't know that. So they took and tore our car down to a, that car downstairs was, was, was torn down to 100 pieces. They took the, all, everything, everything, that, that, that proved they were illegal. So Joe Hoppen of, of, of Volkswagen Special Vehicles from Germany, he asked me what was wrong. I said, nothing. He told him, stop tearing that car down. So what they did, what, it, it was so complicated that what they, I'm, 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 getting, I'm getting excited here. <laughs> Let me settle down, folks. I got an overdrive and I should have been in fourth gear. <laughs> so, so they let us get our money and kept us off the podium with the Viceroy cigarette uniform on and then gave us our money on, on the side and let us, and, and let us, and let us go. So that was what we went through, and I, go, I called Mrs. Scott, Benny's mother, and I told her, I said, we left everything on the track. I said, we couldn't give anymore. She said, the typical mother, she said, but you didn't leave my son on the track. <laughs> and that was, that was the story of what we did. And we went through this, Kenny Wright and I can tell stories Way worse than that. And we can, and, the and last so can race we had, yeah. when, I, when I was running that super nuts. Um, yeah, but stay He said, wait a minute, give him a hand. I'm telling you, that's yeah. Yeah. You heard more detail yeah. than we ever heard before yeah. in that situation. Yeah. yeah. Hey, I want to say one thing about Len. Len it does things in detail. When he says, he knows as much about the car and the track as a driver. Many times, him and I walk the track so he yes. could tell the driver, this will happen here, this will happen here, and you should do this here, and you should. We walk Lime Rock, Watkins yep. Glen, yep. Road Atlanta, yep. Texas. Texas. So he didn't just send the guy out, he knew what that guy had to do. And the second thing I want to say, after that car I drove, and he planned that car from the rear drivetrain to the engine, and everything worked perfect. He got a 69 Camaro. That car ran or broke the national record, but it was in Canada, it was unofficial. 
No, what and happened? Then, yeah, the, and then he had through. a driver who didn't want to yeah. do what he wanted him to do. And that's why they got out of that particular car and went to the yeah. road racing car. Yeah. yeah. So. So ladies and gentlemen, that was the story of the fateful day, May 4th, 1975 in Monterey, California. And I want to actually spend five or six minutes raising the house lights, turning it over to you, because I know that we could do this for another hour, a couple of hours, right? I mean, do, are these stories fascinating or what? And here's the good news. We're gonna open it up. I'm literally gonna do three questions up here, but then we all get to go downstairs. We are all going to see that Viceroy, car number 22, the Super V, with new eyes. We're gonna look at it in a new way. And all of our panelists today are all heading downstairs. You can meet and greet again. If you are inspired to get the book, please do. We would love if you read more about it. But um, I do want to open up the floor. If there is something that you really would like to know, raise your hand. I'll come right over to you. That you didn't touch on, if, if my memory is correct, uh, you didn't mention anything about the Indianapolis 500. Oh. And what? is it my understanding that your, your race team was the first African-American team to field a, a, a an entry in the uh, Indianapolis 500? It, the, an the, answer, the answer is yes. We're the first team in 1972, but that uh, was Brig Owens, so the Washington Redskins uh, safety, uh, Paul Jackson, uh, uh, which had the largest African-American business in the United States at that time, and Richard Deutsch, a friend of the Kennedy family, and I, we, uh, we put the car in the Indianapolis at 500 in, at 1972. And the name of the team was what? Vanguard, Vanguard Racing. Vanguard Racing. So if you want to look it up yeah. in history, you'll see it. And I think Benny was on the team, and you had yes. another driver. The, the other driver was a little bit better John than Benny. It was John, John Mayer, John Mayer. And Benny was his understudy. He was, Benny was his understudy at the Indianapolis That's 500. That's a good point, yeah. That's a great question. Yes, you, sir. Can you tell us about that incredible photo that you have with the legendary Wendell Scott and Malcolm Durham? Yes, uh, that, that photo was, was taken in Hyattsville, Maryland, and we, they were all officers, including Ron, in, in the association, and we actually met and talked about what things we uh, blacks need to, to do to, to, to get ahead. And while you, since you brought up Wendell, Wendell Scott was a, was a personal friend of mine, and uh, Wendell Scott was very disappointed in the movie uh, Grease Lightning. The Richard Pryor, they made that a buffoonery a movie, and he, he, uh, he, ne he never really liked that movie. Something about that movie. I think the, the female star was Pam Greer, was yes. she? They wanted her to do a nude scene in that movie, and Wendell refused to let him do a, a nude scene because that, he was a very religious man, and he didn't want his wife to be represented in, in, in anything of that nature. Uh, it's interesting you brought that up. When the main, uh, we, our main movie script is, is finished for, for Silent Thunder, and I told Rose, I said, Rose, the, 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 the uh, movie script is finished. She said, I don't want any new sins and then any bad. <laughs> <laughs> that's the first, that's the only thing she ever said. <laughs> <laughs> And we have a final question over here. It was a, th thank you very much. It was an outstanding program, incredible history. But Lynn, I certainly understand the challenges that, you, that all, all you gentlemen had uh, during your racing careers, particularly in the early part of your careers. I'm just interested in how, what's your view of NASCAR today as it relates to some of the issues that you've dealt with during your early days? The 
first, first, first of all, I was going to introduce him. That's, I'm surprised to see him today. That's Kerry Kirkland. He's one of the, uh, one of the key undersecretaries in the Wolf administration in Harrisburg, and I, I'm really surprised to see you come all the way from York, Pennsylvania down here, to, here today. And, and I want to say something personal about you. Now, this isn't planned. He, he got a, this, this is not a staged thing here. Uh, Kerry Kirkland is, is one of the uh, uh, young men that has done a lot in the state of Pennsylvania. He was one time the uh, executive director of the, the Democratic uh, uh, Party here. But he was, he was one of the few black soldiers that stood up in Vietnam. In Vietnam, uh, he was uh, putting a lot of the soldiers on point on patrol, and the black soldiers were getting too much of being put on the patrol, and, and his, his commanding officer sent him to Rocket City, and, and there was anybody in here, see Phil Nevis here, anybody knows about Rocket City, that's one of the worst places in the Vietnam War you ever could. They light up the place and rockets come 24 hours a day. And he hunkered down. That man hunkered down and he survived that and he always said that he was going to do good and help uh, people and move, move ahead. So he needs to get a hand right there. Here. Rocket City. The uh, downstairs, there's a second book written by our son, Lenny, which I'll autograph it, Racing Wild Black. Anyone in here wants to get a view of what NASCAR and the types of things surrounding NASCAR, get that book, Racing Wild Black, today. Why? I have said to Marjan, it was suppressed that book has been suppressed in here in the United States. But believe it or not, Racing Wild Black is a bestseller English version in mainland China. China picked the book, book up and, and, and it's a bestseller, it's a bestseller over there. NASCAR, NASCAR is running a plantation, a plantation system out of the antebellum age. That's how, that's how bad it is. Uh, uh, it's so bad, it, it's so bad that, that a, a black driver coming up through a black environment has to lose all their identity to survive in NASCAR. For example, NASCAR carry on the, uh, when they have Grand Marshal, they have Clarence Thomas. It, 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 most of the NASCAR black fans turn turn off the NASCAR right there. They have they have a driver now uh, uh, coming through. It's his it, his name is Bubba Wallace. Bubba Bubba is something like out of Ar Ozarks and and in Arkansas, mainstream black community is not following him. Then his last name is Wallace, and he's from Alabama, and you got Governor Wallace all over again. <laughs> so you've got a staging, staging people is one thing, and the other thing at fault is, on the other side of it, being even-handed, being even-handed, the black athletes and entertainers have put in a total of about $50 million in NASCAR in the last 10 or uh, 11 years and have not one dollar to show for it. For example, two years ago, 50 cents put in 17 million. You've got, you've got, you've got Randy Moss, all these guys go in and they get, ri they, 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 they get ripped off. Um, uh, so any, anyway, I don't want to I don't want to uh, belabor that point. But get the book downstairs, Racing Wild Black, and that'll explain a lot of things that that I'm um, not bringing up. Yes.
it, it went to what it what it what what it is the 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 uh, uh, the black athletes and entertainers will invest. They'll say, "Let's start a team. Uh, we got this idea, and we want to start the team uh, to do X, Y, and Z. So we need fifty million dollars from you, or twenty million, whatever, it, from you. So they take the twenty million dollars, they raise their salaries." Salaries. Their own salaries, that's right, Ron, correct me, they raise their own, own salaries, buy the equipment in another company's name, take these big bonuses, and you have no money. Okay. That's what happens. Read, read the book, Racing Wild Black. <laughs> Downstairs. And on that note. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, on that note, I want to thank you for your community, for your hearts, for yeah. listening, and most of all, sure did, yeah. one last round of applause for Len, Bill, Carl, <laughs> Huck, Ken. And John. <laughs>